This morning, what we're going to discuss, as I said, is a touchy subject when it comes to the enemy because he doesn't like it. He doesn't want you to know what the, what the church, how it was designed to be, to be because as it functions today, in many areas, it's not functioning properly because it's not going off the foundational steps that Christ laid in place that, that he had set up. And it's called the fivefold ministry. And I'm sure some of you have heard that. That's a, that's a pretty popular religious term, the fivefold ministry. And I thought I knew it. I really did. And Mike asked me to do the sermon. And I was like, oh, man, I got this. I got this. And I called him up a couple days later, or actually I shot him a text. And I was like, brother, you know, I only thought that I knew what the fivefold ministry was. I mean, I know what the titles are. You know, you got your apostle, the prophet. You got the preacher, the teacher, and the evangelist. I thought I knew what they were. I, I, I just thought. And that's the problem. I thought. I didn't let him do my thinking for me. Because God started opening up my eyes to so many different things. And what I really started to see was the position that we're in today as a global church. And the position that we're in today absolutely breaks my heart. And to be honest, I think there's times, there's a lot of times when Jesus is looking down on us with a big smile on his face, but I believe there's times when he looks down at his church, at his bride, who is by no means ready for him. And I've got a feeling he may have a tear in his eye. Because I do believe that we are far from being ready for him. I'm not saying us as a church body, I'm saying the global church, the big C church. We're just a little C. And this building that we're sitting in, this isn't the church. This building could burn to the ground tomorrow and the church would still be here. As long as we showed up, the church would still be here. The church is inside of you. It's when we get together, when we fellowship, when we love one another, when we go out and do the work of God, when we go out and, and try to bring forth and, and, and cater to his people. Cater to the ones who are living in sin. That's the church. So let me start us off by reading from the good book. I'm going to read Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. And don't, don't let the, the translation that I'm reading right here, the version that I'm reading, don't let it throw you off or anything because I don't, I don't know a lot of people that read out of the Amplified, but I love, I absolutely love the Amplified version. And that's what I'm going to be preaching out of this morning. Um, your version will go right along with it, but the Amplified just throws in a few more words, so... Ephesians 4.11 says, And his gifts to the church were varied, and he himself appointed some as apostles, special messengers and representatives, some as prophets who speak a new message from God to the people, some as evangelists who spread the good news of salvation, and some as pastors and teachers to shepherd and guide and instruct. And he did this to fully equip Equip, I'm sorry, not equipped. To fully equip and perfect the saints. God's people for works of service. To get out in the community. To equip you to go and minister to the lost. To build up the body of Christ, the church. Until we all reach oneness in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Growing spiritually to become a mature believer. Reaching to the measure of of the fullness of Christ, hallelujah, manifesting his spiritual completeness and exercising our spiritual gifts in unity, exercising our spiritual gifts. How many of us can honestly say, say that, we, that we exercise our spiritual gifts on a regular basis? I mean, right now, me standing up here preaching, yet... Preachers, one of the gifts, that's, that's a gift, but this, this isn't my gift. This isn't me exercising my gift. I'm, I'm answering a calling that God has placed on my heart. This is, this is enjoyment for me. This is, a, this is a means of worship for me. But this is Sunday morning. This is what we're supposed to do. This is tradition. This is, this is a, a routine, so to speak. How many of us throughout our days, throughout the week, practice our spiritual gifts? It's just food for thought. Now, see, when we look at the five-fold ministry, 
We need to understand how all five work together for the good of the church, which is the body of Christ. And see, th this morning I'm going to, to mention all five of them, but I'm only going to touch on the first two, which is the apostle and prophet. Next week, Mr. Lester will be teaching the sermon, and he's going to speak on the last three. So you'll hear me mention them, but this morning I'm just teaching on the two. And just a little side note for you to stick in your head. When you hear me mention something this morning and you hear me say he, don't take it personally. It's just for, for ease of my notes. Um, when, I, when I say he, think of he or she because God can use man or woman. He will gift man or woman to do his works. I know some mighty women of God, and I know some awfully, I mean, just terrible, slacking men of God. Women are just as important to the Father, and it's just as useful to the Father as any man. So please don't misinterpret what I'm saying up here this morning, because if I say he, just think of that as he or she. Just got to get that out there. Don't want to offend anyone. My wife's sitting over there saying right now, yeah, you, you got that right. She knows she's just as good as I am. She's better than me, actually. All right. First and foremost, I want to go over a few statistics this morning. And, and I'm not a numbers person. I was actually talking to a good friend of mine the other day. And, look, I cannot stand numbers. My mom can testify to that because I failed math. I couldn't tell you how many times in high school. My teacher could testify to it very, very strongly. I'm not a numbers person. But what I do like about numbers is numbers represents a person. But the numbers that I'm getting into this morning are scary. These, these statistics are scary. 1,800 pastors leave the ministry every month. 40% of pastors will not be in ministry in 10, in 10 years. 50% of pastors feel unable to meet the needs of the job. 80% believe that pastoral ministry negatively affects their families. 45% of pastors say they've experienced depression or burnout to the extent they've needed to leave of absence from ministry. 33% felt burned out within their, their first five years of ministry. Guys, that's sad. These are men that you've, you've I'm sure you've known some. These are men of God that have felt burned out and left the ministry for one reason and one re reason alone. Because the church wasn't operating through the fivefold ministry. The pastor, it was placed on his shoulders to do it all. The church was the pastor. He was the face. All the burden was on the shoulders of one man. And it's not been meant to be that way. And there's no way to entirely alleviate the pressure that pastors face on a daily basis, especially our pastor, because I can testify to the fact that this man is reaching out to anyone and everyone he can that needs him, and I'm speaking of Pastor Mike. There's no way to alleviate the pain that pastors feel. There's not, but if we can learn what the fivefold ministry is all about what these giftings are and we can recognize those giftings inside us because make no mistake people I'm telling you right now I can see it in many of you I can see it in all of you but there's so much potential in some of you to operate in these gifts that you wouldn't believe it right now I'm looking at preachers and teachers pastors evangelists prophets and apostles Many of you that I've spoke to, a good friend of mine I was just talking to on Friday, and he has lived a life that is so far from Jesus that you wouldn't believe it. And I told him, he's, we were talking about how, how we both like to talk so much. Because I, I, my wife will tell you, I can have a conversation with that brick wall, and it'd be a really good conversation. I know you've all heard me say that before. I like to talk. I'm sorry. But I was telling him, I was like, see, I've been telling you that that deep inside of you is a powerful man of God. And somewhere in there, I'm telling you, there's a preacher, there's a teacher that's wanting to come out. These gifts are inside all of us. He equips us as those gifts are needed. 
He doesn't just equip one to do this job and one to do that job. Granted, there are people that operate in that singular gift, but they also expand out to the others. Just because someone is gifted as, an, as a prophet doesn't mean they can't walk the task of an apostle. Just because someone's a preacher doesn't mean he can't teach or evangelize. And a lot of us get that confused and we think, that well, that's pretty much the same title. It's really not. I've got an illustration that I'm on, that's going to be shown here in just a second that will give us a better view of what these things are. See, fivefold ministers are meant to, to work in their particular calling to help each other out, for the ministry, for the church to work together so that it doesn't fall apart. And right now, that's what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing. The church is falling apart. We shouldn't have government organizations that take care of the homeless or the needy. That's not the job of our government. That is the job of the church. That is our position. Why are they stepping up and doing it? Because the church is slacking. We're slacking. And again, I'm not talking about this church body. I'm talking about globally. We're slacking. Because we don't know how exactly the church is supposed to operate. We've got one man. And forgive me, Lord, I keep wanting to throw a man's name out there and... It's nobody in town. It's a big TV evangelist. But we throw one man out in the limelight, and that man is the church. And that isn't right. It's not. That burden can't be placed on one person's shoulders. And if that person wishes it to all be him, then that's a red flag. That's a red flag because you can automatically tell that it's all about him and it's not about God. It's not about God's design. Because it's all about him. The five are supposed to work together to carry out the Great Commission for the equipping of the saints to go out and do the work of ministry, to go out and help people, to go out and spread the gospel. It's not the job of one man. And what's going to happen to that one man is he's going to fall terribly and more than likely with the stress that it's going to be causing because stress is a huge, has huge health factors, he's probably going to die at an early age. It's not about one person. It's not about one person. It's about God's hand of ministry. 1 Peter 5, 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 Peter 5, 6. I'm going to take me a drink of water. While, if you have your Bibles, turn to it. And while you're doing that, I'm going to take a sip. It says this, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Can I tell you this morning that when the fivefold works together in the church, through the church, that when you can truly experience that, you will witness the hand of God at work. Oh, you're crazy. No, I'm not. I've never seen it before. I can't speak from experience on that. I can honestly say that I've never been to a church that was set up that way. It's set up that way here. It's getting to that point. There's no one that I've ever met like Pastor Mike who wants to allow people to get up on the stage and, and, and carry out their giftings, to walk in the anointing that God has placed on their life. But I've never been to a church that is, that is just completely 100% working through the fivefold. But why I can tell you that it exists is because I walk by faith and not by sight. It says it right here, so I know it exists. It's up to us to bring it to be. I know this is a different kind of message. It's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a 
way out there message than what I'm used to preaching. I normally take a topic that we go through on a daily basis and I, I, I put what I know around it and make it fit a person's lifestyle. And <clears throat> I'm telling you, I started out doing this message this way. And for the life of me, I've got my flesh in the back of my mind telling me right now to apologize to them that this sounds like a classroom lecture. But I'm not going to apologize because this is what the Holy Spirit placed on my heart. And this is what, if it's just one of you, if it's just one in this room today, it's what you need to hear. But this is what the whole, the church as a whole needs to hear. If we don't get this, people, if we do not get this church, if we do not get this, then the church is going to fall. And the Bible tells us that if, if, if man won't worship me, then I'll cause the stones to speak out and worship me. So God doesn't absolutely need you. He wants you. He wants you to work in this fivefold. He wants you to work throughout your spiritual gifts that we're learning about. This is what the church needs to hear. And I'm honored that he chose me to give it to you, to deliver it to you. But make no mistake, if I could, I'd have a curtain thrown up in front of me and all you'd hear is a voice because this is not about me. This is not about Shane Morgan. I'm not that, imp uh, that important of a person. I'm a metal fabricator that's lived a life of sin. I, you would not have wanted to know me back in the day. Ryan would have because he'd have put the cuffs on me. I'd have been another notch in his belt. I have not always been a good person, but praise God, I am now. I can say that with a surety. I can say that 100% I am a good person now because of the works that Christ has done through me, done in me and through me. He wants to do those same works in you, in you, in you, and through all of you. I urge you to take notes, to, li to listen and take notes and study these things out on your own. Study to show yourself approved, a workman unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study these things out because any preacher can stand up here on this platform and we can preach to you till we're blue in the face and we can have a three hour long sermon and it is never going to dig in deep into your heart and into your mind until you get into the word yourself. We're here to guide you in the right direction. That's the whole point in this platform is to deliver the truth and point you in the right direction. <clears throat> when Christ ascended, he took the whole ministry mantle and he divided it and gave it in five parts to men and women. And all five are needed to perfect, to mature, and equip the saints. All five. Ephesians 4.13 <clears throat> says this, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of the fullness of Christ. See, the function of these gifts also is called the ascension of the gifts. And how they fit together, if we learn that, we can better understand this analogy of how the physical, or we can put a physical picture, a mental picture, and we can better understand how these gifts work. The function of these gifts, also sometimes called equipping of the, uh, or ascension of gifts. I just read that. <laughs> this analogy, it'll give us a way of understanding how they function by thinking about the way a hand functions. All right? You've got the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, and the teacher. These are all foundational stones that are set in place after the cornerstone, which is Christ. They support and they rest the body. They are not at some lofty position and they're not to be conceited in themselves. They're to humble themselves and work together to see the work of God 
come to be. The apostle, if you'll notice, if I can get the picture back up. If you'll notice, the apostle, well, they're showing their right hand, so I'm going to show my right hand. The apostle is the thumb. And I want you to think about it. It's not in opposition <coughs> to or over the other fingers. It allows everything to work on its own, but is designed to complete the full function and power of the hand. So think about it like this. You can ball your fist up like this, but you can't truly have a good grip on anything. I don't know if you've ever done chin-ups before, but if you try to do chin-ups with your thumb down on the bar or face forward the way you're, want, you're supposed to do them, it's a whole lot harder. That's why nobody really wants to do it. They want to flip their hands around backwards and wrap their thumb around the bar so they can pull themselves up. But that's the way you're supposed to. But it doesn't want to fit right. If you ball your fist up, your thumbs, keeping these fingers protected, keeping them together so they don't spread out. So if you punch something, they don't spread, they don't break. If you punch it correctly, I've broke mine before when I was... Uh, well, I'm still a knucklehead, but back in my worst, my, the, the worst part of my days. Apostles function to, in administration and together with prophets. They lay the foundation with proper doctrinal and spiritual structure, as we see in Ephesians 2.20. The apostle moves primarily in the gifts of healing, in the gifts of faith, the, gifts, the working of miracles, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, and sometimes prophecy. And when I was reading this and studying this out, it, it honestly showed me, I know our pastor, he walks in a strong prophetic gift, but I can see such an, uh, an apostolic gift on top of this man. His, his mantle is so wide. But in the modern church setting, they would oversee the development. The, the apostle would oversee the development of sending out apostolic teams for miracle ministries. And let me ask you this. How many miracles have you seen actually take place in front of your eyes? True miracles. Yes, a baby being born is a, is a true miracle. We've all witnessed this man right here being raised from the dead. Those of you that have been here for a while. Todd Boland was dead in the middle of the road. And he came back to life to be with us today, all by the grace of God. And I praise God for it. He's a good man. He's a dear friend of mine. I had cancer back in, was it 2014? Right after my dad died, my father had just passed away. And two days after he passed away, he wasn't even in the ground yet. Two days after he passed away, I went for an angiogram. And my wife's a nurse. Am I saying that right? Okay, I'm saying it right. So, yay. I went to have an angiogram done. And they found a spot. What'd they call it? They said, we have found a questionable nodule on your thyroid. Like, look, you're speaking a completely just, you're speaking a different language than what I know. My wife's right out here behind the curtain or outside the curtain. Um, she's a nurse. Could she come in here and you could speak this to her and she could translate it for me? Um, well, they explained everything to my wife, and they said that we, he really needs to go see a doctor. And Kay told him, and she said, well, he's got a doctor's appointment next month, so we'll mention it to Dr. Douglas when he goes to see him. She said, no, no, it can't wait. So I set up an appointment, get it checked out. They sent me for all these tests and everything. And normally these tests would take months to get in order. I knew within a couple of weeks that I had, thyro uh, had thyroid cancer. But, praise God, they called it way, way early. When I was sitting in front of Dr. Scott, the surgeon that removed my thyroid, he told me, he said, Shane, and this is the first doctor I've ever had speak to me about God. He said, Shane, he said, I'm telling you right now that this has God written all over it. For those of you that don't know what an angiogram is, it's a, it's a, a scan that you go have, kind of like an ultrasound where they check your, your arteries to find if there's a blockage of some sort. Um, he looked at me and told me, he said, for one, there's no reason why a 32-year-old man should go and have an angiogram done unless it's ordered by a doctor. There's no reason. He said, especially since you just told me that your dad just passed away a couple days ago. 
Not to mention there was ice on the ground. We were just in the we just had a a, a freak uh, winter storm. He said there was no reason for you to go have this test done. And then they found this. He said then I shouldn't have seen you for another couple months, but you're in here now, and we know what it is. And he said I'm gonna tell you right now we've we've caught this so early. I didn't have to go through any chemo. I didn't have to go through any special treatments. Nothing. They removed my thyroid. The cancer is gone. I never have to worry about that again. So praise God. God is still in the job of working miracles. I can give you another of other instances. And I'm looking down here and I'm trying not to look at my mama because she's going to make me cry. I can give you another umpteen million instances as to why I shouldn't be here on this stage talking to you right now. But I'm not going to I'm not gonna bore you with all that. Um, it's going to take too long if I do, for one. And I can, I can hear it in your, in your voices, in the back of your head. I can hear your minds talking to you, saying, I wish he would hurry up. I wish. The word apostle, let me get back to this. The word apostle means one sent forth. You can kind of think of an apostle as a missionary. That are sent, they go out to, to foreign lands. They go out to the, there's a lot of missionaries that just leave Georgia and go to New York, but it's still a foreign land to them. They go out to all over to carry out the Great Commission. So you can think of an apostle sort of like an, a missionary. And if you kind of think about it, you know, didn't our pastor come from Pennsylvania all the way to Georgia to, and started up a church, yada, yada, yada. Uh, yeah, yeah, just throwing that out there. Apostles function in administration and together with the prophets lay the foundation of the church. They lay the foundation of the church. Think about it like this. All right? You've got Jesus Christ. And for those of you that don't know anything about setting a foundation on a house or anything, you always start with a cornerstone. You've got to. That stone's got to be squared up to the direction of the house is going to be laid. The foundation is, and that's, the foundation is what? It's what the house is built on. That cornerstone is the perfect right angle in which that foundation is going to be laid. So with Jesus Christ as our cornerstone, the apostle and the prophet go out. That's the way the church is designed. And we don't live it that way. We don't have church that way. It's not carried out that way. And that's why, as I said, we're seeing the church fall in a sense. The apostle is a pioneer who establishes churches and lays foundational truth in people's lives. We see that in Ephesians 2.20. And a lot of these verses, I don't know if they're going to throw them up here or not, but I'm just throwing these down here for you to write down and take it as a reference point. Um, apostles could be called spiritual builders. We can see this in 1 Corinthians 3.10. Uh, they have oversight of the body. We see this in 1 Corinthians 4.15. And the ministry of apostle is the most let me put this out there. It is the most neglected of the fivefold ministries in the church today. We have many pastors. We have many preachers. We have many teachers. And we have a few prophets. But very few apostles. And one reason behind that is, is because the traditional, I don't know if it's really a word, but the traditionalism that we live in with the church today, that old school traditional foundation that has been set in our bones since, the, since we were born is at work today. And that's the reason why we don't see the apostle. Why? Because it's taking the glory from the preacher. Because the apostle is the one that's going out and equipping the saints. It's taking the glory from the pastor. Aren't you glad that we've got a pastor that doesn't worry about receiving the glory, that he gives all the glory to God? I know I am. And I praise God for him. Although they hold a special place, just as the original apostles, because there's a lot of people out there that think that, that the original apostles were the only apostles, that God doesn't equip people to walk in this office anymore. I've read a lot where, where, where people just believe that this office died when the original 12 passed away. That's not true. It's not true. We can see this all throughout the Bible. In Acts 1.26, there's Matthias. Uh, Acts 14.1, 4.14, and all over the Bible you see Paul. All over the New Testament, that is. Uh, Titus in 2 Corinthians. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Epaphroditus in Philippians. Uh, Silas and Tim Timothy in 1 Thessalonians. 
Thessalonians. I'm getting tongue twisted because I'm trying to hurry up for you guys. Also, Andronicus and Junia, listed in Romans 16, 7, were possibly apostles. They were never listed as apostles. Paul wasn't one of the original 12. Pastors today lean on the, on, on the word, and please forgive me, Father, if I get this wrong, but I think I'm right. In Ephesians, where it's spoken that when Judas died, when Judas hung himself for betraying Christ, they had to fill that 12th position. And this is what pastors hang their hat on. So many of them, not all, because our pastor is not one of them. I'm not one of them. Ryan's not one of them. Any pastor that you have here, and there's a number of other pastors are the same. We don't hang our hat on this, but many do. They look to the point, to the fact that it is said that when Judas died, that we need to equip, reach out to another person who has witnessed Christ dying on the cross, who lived under his teaching and witnessed him raising again. So they hang their hat on the fact that you have to be a witness of those three things before you can be an apostle. But that office still stands true today, just as the many passages I've read to you state. That office still stands true. The fivefold ministry will not be done away with until the day that our Lord and Savior returns to take us home to paradise. So make no mistake that these offices are still working today. These officers that stand in this place are still alive and gifted today. I'm not even going to mention what my gifts are because I'm not going to stand up here and try to make it say, well, look, look at me. I'm not going to do that because it's not about me. It's not about you when you're witnessing to someone. It's all about him. It's all about him. The book of Acts reveals how the apostolic ministry functioned in the early church. As the apostles traveled and evangelized, they saw a need for permanent leadership in the churches. So they appointed men to be pastors over these churches, to be shepherds over these churches. That's what a pastor is, is a shepherd. The Bible does not teach, as I said, that the, five, that the, the apostle inside the fivefold ministry was to cease. Quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. So we're going to move on to the second finger on the hand. And that would be the fivefold prophet. When I was looking at this picture, thought ran through my mind and I was like, man, I don't know if I am or not. I know I've walked in that calling before, but I really don't want to be known as the evangelist. But, just a little side note on the evangelist, he goes out further than the rest. It's just a little bit further because your middle finger is longer than the rest. So he, unless you're like Pastor Mike and it's, one of your fingers has been chopped off at the nub. But the evangelist goes out further than the rest. The fivefold prophet, though, the forefinger is often called the pointer finger. The prophet functions in revelation and points the way for new believers. When we think of prophets, a lot of times we think of people that can see the future. Um, like if you've ever heard of uh, that guy that they all claim is a, a, a prophet, um, but I'm not 100% sold on that, Nostradamus. I mean, he's well known throughout history of predicting the future, but I've got a just strong feeling that if it was of God, that he wouldn't have pronounced Hitler as history or any of that. But anyway, if it's of God, it's if, if it's of God, it's going to be detailed. It's going to be perfect because it's of the perfect one. The prophet, granted, they can be giving sight and vision to see the future, but that's not all that they're here to do. They're here to receive a word of God and bring it to the church. Individually, I'm sure there's many of you that have sat down and spoke with someone who walks in this gift, whether you knew they walked in this gift or not, and they told you something about yourself that just rung a bell. They told you something that's going on in your life that they sh shouldn't have a clue about, and it rings a bell. When that bell rings, it's kind of like the Holy Spirit's ringing that bell at the end of the fight because that opens up your heart to be able to receive what He has for you. 
that person that rung that bell, granted, like I said, it was the Holy Spirit ringing the bell, but that person that was speaking to you was a prophet speaking a word of truth into your life. But there's very few here in the churches today. And guys, it saddens my heart. The prophet is one who speaks for God to man. Now, don't take me wrong here. I'm not saying that you have to go to man to receive a word from God. That's not what I'm saying. When Christ died on that cross 2,000 years ago, when he said it is finished and he died on that cross, the veil was torn, not from the bottom up, as it would be if man did it. Now, if you picture a veil that's higher than this building and thicker than these walls, that veil was torn from the top to the bottom. When that veil was torn, it opened up the place that, that, that was known as the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, was held. Normal man, before Christ died, wasn't able to go back into the Holy of Holies. It had to be a sanctified priest. And even then, they tied a rope around his waist just in case he didn't make it so they could drag him back out. Because if you, if, if you walk in the presence of God and you're not cleansed properly, they would fall to the ground. Because of the blood of Christ and that veil being torn, we can now communicate to the Father, praise God, one-on-one. -on -one. We don't have to go to a confessional and speak to a priest. We can speak to the Father all on our own. We don't have to go to our pastor and say, and it's good that you do because you trust your pastor. You don't have to go to another man and say, Will you pray for me? I need a word from God. No, you don't rely on that other man to get you a word from God. You rely on you. You rely on this man or this woman to get a word from God. God wants you to work in these gifts, but God wants you to know that he can speak to you and you and you and you individually. You don't have to rely on man. You have to rely on the Father. Him and him alone. Or should I say the Trinity? And I'm almost finished. My son's sitting here saying, thank God. That is proof that there is a God. I'm talking about you, Kyler. I'm not looking at Nathan. I had to throw him out there just kind of like a hot poker. The office of a prophet is different than the gifts of prophecy it carries. It carries such a governmental authority and role with higher responsibilities. The gift of prophecy is for the edification and exhortation. Did I say that right? Yes, Extor exhortation, exhortation <laughs> and comfort, whereas the prophet flows in areas of guidance, instruction, rebuke, judgment, and revelation, whatever Christ chooses to speak for the purification and sanctification of his bride which is what the church prophets are also given the special ability to recognize God's gifts and callings kind of like I was just telling you that I've, I've, I've spoke to many of you and I see those gifts operating inside of you you're just not allowing them to flow not everyone who prophesies is a prophet just as not everyone who moves in miracles is an apostle. In a church today, prophets would oversee the development of qualified prophetic teams to be able to give accurate and timely personal prophetic words and form prophetic presbyteries. That's a big word, especially for me. Group of ministers and elders who come together for the purpose of ministering prophetically to individuals or a church body. Like I said, I know this is kind of like a classroom lesson, but you need this, I'm telling you, you need it. A prophet is one who speaks for God to man, just as I said. According to 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it says this, But, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, to promote their spiritual growth, and speaks words of encouragement to uphold and advise them concerning the matters of God, and speaks words of consolation to compassionately comfort them that's that's the ticket right there to compassionately comfort them if you have somebody come up and I have to be gentle when I say this 
if someone comes up to you and is just in your face and blunt saying that you, you, you are living in this, you're living in this, you're doing this, you're doing this, 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 and this, and they're doing this in front of other people and it's not just you and you, them alone, and they're just so in your face, it's not of God. It's not of God. So you can take everything that you're telling you and just not necessarily toss it out the door because they may just not understand what they're walking in, but you can pretty much just brush that to the side because if it's of God, it is done compassionately. It's done lovingly. It's done to raise up and build up the church, not tear it down. And I'm here to tell you that words have a way of tearing you down. The example that I've always liked to use is your words are like a hammer. Many of you have used a hammer before in your life. You've used it either to build something or you've used it to demolish something. Your words are the same way. You can use those words to build a person up or you can use those same words to tear a person down. If someone comes to you and they're not working in love when they speak to you about these things, then I'm telling you right now that it's not of God. And not that you have to just turn tail and run away, but that's really what you need to do. Not because you're scared of them, just because you don't want to hear what they have to say. They're not speaking truth into your heart. They're tearing you down. All they're doing is pointing out all the faults that you have and telling you what they think you can do to fix it, not what the Father wants you to do. Prophecy is giving to edify and comfort. Prophecy always, always, did I mention it should always serve to comfort? Sometimes a hard message comes. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes we may be offended by a hard message. And we may feel hurt. But that's a different kind of hurt. That right there is conviction of the Holy Spirit. If that hard word comes, that, what I mean by that hard word is when a pastor brings a message or a prophet brings a message and it's something that speaks so strongly to your heart that you know that that's something that you've been walking in and it just stepped on your toes is what it is. Well, if you're... Gonna throw this out there. If your toes are getting stepped on, maybe you need to move your feet back and try to think better about where you're putting them. Maybe you shouldn't be putting your toes in whatever's causing them to get stepped on. That's why that encouraging word, that encouraging hard word hurts because it's hitting us at home. The sin, the issue that we're walking in, that we're living in, is being talked about. It's conviction. It's you being ashamed of what you're living in. And make no mistake, there is not one single solitary perfect person in this room right now. Not even me or the pastor that you hear being talked about so highly. There's not one single solitary perfect person in this house or in this world. The only perfect person died on that cross 2,000 years ago. And three days later, he jumped up and said, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. How many of you this morning are thankful that that happened for you? Because I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you that it happened to you. And just to throw out a few other New Testament prophets so you can just have them for a little food for thought. John the Baptist, he spoke many prophecies. You can reference that to Luke 1, 76. Agabus in Acts eleven twenty seven, and in chapter 21. John was sent forth as a prophet through the tender mercy of God. Just imagine, this man baptized Jesus Christ himself. How awesome is that? But make no mistake, guys. I'm going to repeat this because it's important. That true prophecy will always, always be tempered with grace.